শুভঙ্কর হ্যাঁ বলছি ফ্লায়ার এর লিংক থেকে অনেকে জয়েন করতে অসুবিধা হচ্ছে বলছি আমাকে হচ্ছে <laughs> 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 আপনাকে 
হ্যাঁ ঠিক আছে স্যার এই অর্ক শুরু করবে এবার ভাস্কর শুরু করে দে প্রণাম দেবেন প্রণাম দেবেন মানে সাক্ষাৎ করছে না দূর থেকে দূর থেকেই জানাচ্ছি টিচার বলবো আমাদের গুরুজনরা সবাই জয়েন করেছে প্লাস স্টুডেন্টরা জয়েন করেছে Welcoming you all, uh, you know, nah, the reason behind is uh, we have amongst us Orko Bokshi. Orko, he has switched on the video, he is uh, right in front of you. Uh, if you are in front of your digital devices, you can see him there. Uh, he also actually has been, the, uh, my, was my student, right? was my uh, undergraduate student when I was in Presidency College. সামনে আমাদের গভর্নমেন্ট কলেজ এর প্রোডাক্ট এন্ড হি হ্যাজ ডান হিজ বিএসসি फ्रॉम এ गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज এমএসসি फ्रॉम এ गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज এন্ড দেন হি ওয়েন্ট अहेड এন্ড আজকে এনআইআরএফ র‍্যাঙ্কিং বেরিয়েছে ইন্ডিয়ান ইনস্টিটিউট অফ সায়েন্স ইজ দা নাম্বার 1 রিসার্চ ইনস্টিটিউট অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ দা নাম্বার 1 ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ ইন্ডিয়া ঠিক আছে আজকে ইন্ডিয়ান ইনস্টিটিউট অফ সায়েন্স ও সেখান থেকে পিএইচডি করেছে এবং ফার্স্ট অফ অল লেট মি ওয়েলকাম আওয়ার প্রিন্সিপাল স্যার ডক্টর শান্তনু চক্রবর্তী এবং আমাদের আইকিউএসি কোয়ার্ডিনেটর ডক্টর চৈতালি ম্যাডামকে চৈতালি চৌধুরী ম্যাডামকে এবং আমাদের হেড অফ দ্য ডিপার্টমেন্ট দেবজ্যোতি চক্রবর্তী মহাশয়কে এবং অল যারা সবাই আছে স্টুডেন্টরা তোমরাও এসেছো সবাইকে ওয়েলকাম অ্যান্ড অর্ক বক্সি ডক্টর অর্ক বক্সি আমার কি ভালো লাগছে ডক্টর অর্ক বক্সি বলতে হ্যাঁ ডক্টর অর্ক বক্সিকে একটু ইন্ট্রোডিউস করে দিই তোমাদের সামনে সো অর্ক বক্সি অ্যাকচুয়ালি ইজ কারেন্টলি ওয়ার্কিং অ্যাট দ্য টেকনিক্যাল ইউনিভার্সিটি ফ্যাকাল্টি অফ মেডিসিন ড্রেসডেন্ট ড্রেসডেন্ট তোমরা যদি ম্যাপে দেখো এটা জার্মানিতে খুব টেকনিক্যাল ইউনিভার্সিটি ইজ এ রেপুটেড অ্যান্ড রিনাউন্ড ইউনিভার্সিটি ওখানে আমাদের প্রেসেন্সের অনেকেই আছে তরায়া দেব মল্লিক বলে আরেকটি ছাত্রী আমাদের ঠিক আছে ড্রেসডেনে ও আমার ল্যাবে সেখানে <laughs> endocrinology and reproductive biology niye kaaj koreche and then went ahead to publish uh, some very good papers in international scientific journals and also presented lot of very good seminars and symposiums jekhane o nijer paper present koreche portugal e usa te and uh, you can see students that in front of you or koda tomader samne ache and you can take this opportunity to get his number or email id and get in touch with him 
and explore your future opportunities. Uh, I take this opportunity to request our uh, principal sir to say a few words. प्रणाम प्रातन हेड डर पीयूष कानी सहा गवर्नमेंट कलेज बड़ा सब आगे प्रजन्म समस्त मानस के एक संगे फले खुबी आनंद आनंद लज्जा नहीं डिग्री कोर्स कलेज शुरू करी देरी शुरू हो फिर जो मास्टर डिग्री खुलसी बाराथन कलेज प्रेसिडेंसि आज तक कथा समस्त सिनियर टीचार अनुरोध करें भास्कर सवार संगे भाव चलते शुरू कर थैंक यू भास्कर 
thank you to everyone who joined us uh, this afternoon. Uh, respected principal sir, esteemed faculty members of my college and from other colleges, uh, dignitaries, I can see PK sat there, I can see Rupendra sir is there, uh, and obviously my uh, beloved students. On behalf of IQSC, I welcome all the participants in this international webinar organized by Department of Zoology uh, in collaboration with IQSC Government General Degree College, Shingo. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, that we have with us today Dr. Orko Bokshi as our speaker. Uh, we are truly delighted with your presence, Orko. Uh, a warm welcome and uh, heartfelt thanks to you. Uh, and I also want to uh, congratulate our zoology department for this endeavor. And uh, I hope um, it will be an useful and enlightened session. And looking forward to that. Thank you once again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for uh, saying some valuable words. Uh, head of the department. Unio Tumar Barsha Government College at Chile, to me Cholejava Tik Pori Ashwin Uni Join Korachin. To me, I'm Jaina, whether you know him, uh, Dr. Devojoti Chakraborty. I request Dr. Devojoti Chakraborty, sir, to please uh, say a few words. And uh, after that, we'll be in the, without wasting any time, we'll begin this session. Dhonabad, or Koshate Amar Purija Haini Ekarune. যে আমি 2011 সেপ্টেম্বরে জয়েন করি ও বোধহয় তার আগেই তার ওর সার্টিফিকেট জুলাইয়ে পরীক্ষা দিয়ে পেয়ে যায় কিংবা আমাকে হয়তো দেখেছে যে ওই মার্কশিট টার্কশিট আনতে গিয়ে ডাইরেক্ট ইন্টারঅ্যাকশনটা হয়নি যাই হোক আমাদেরই ছাত্র সে আজকে ভালো জায়গায় আছে এইটা বলতে গিয়ে আমার একটা কথা মনে পড়ে যাচ্ছে যে ভালো মাঠ কিন্তু ভালো প্লেয়ারকে তৈরি করে না ভালো প্লেয়ার যে কোনো মাঠ থেকেই তৈরি হতে পারে সুতরাং আমাদের যে জায়গাগুলো থেকে আজকে ভালো ভালো ছেলেরা তৈরি হচ্ছে সেইখানে আমাদের নতুন কোচেরা থাকতে পেরে আমরা সমৃদ্ধ এই কারণে দেখো বিষয় তোমাদের কাছে ভবিষ্যৎ তোমরা হচ্ছে আমরা হচ্ছে পূর্ণ বিকশিত চাঁদ তুমি অর্ক প্রতিপদের চাঁদ তোমার বিকাশ ঘটবে আমার বিকাশ ঘটে গেছে আমি এরপরে আমাবস্যায় চলে যাব তোমার আলোকে যাতে আমাকে লোকে চিনতে পারে সেই রকম ভাবে তুমি কিছু করো এই আশা রেখে আমি আমার বক্তব্য শেষ করব থ্যাংক ইউ দেবজ্যোতি স্যার থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ সো অর্ক সূর্যের মতনই আমাদেরকে আরো আলো ছড়িয়ে দিক আমিও সূর্য ভাস্কর হ্যাঁ তো যাই হোক তো লেটস স্টার্ট দ্য সেমিনার uh thank you students for coming and tumra puro puro seminar ta shuno ebong then we will have some question answer session and the topic of the seminar today's webinar rather i should say is uh, because we we are using web resource is meiosis the unique cell division regulating the continuity of life over to you orko thank you so much please okay ami prothomei shobai ke dhonnobad janati chai amar somondhe eto bhalo kotha bola অনেখানে অনেকে আমার টিচার আমার ডাইরেক্ট টিচার এবং মানে তাছাড়াও আমি অনেককে চিনি এবং আমার খুব ভালো লাগছে আজকে টকটা দিতে পারে আই উইল টক মাই টক উইল বি ইন ইংলিশ বিকজ আই ওয়ান্ট টু মেক ইট জেনারেল অ্যান্ড উইথ দ্যাট আই উড লাইক টু বিগিন হোপফুলি আই ক্যান কিপ আপ উইথ অল দ্য প্রেজেস দ্যার আই গট অ্যান্ড ডু আ গুড জব জাস্ট ওয়ান রিকোয়েস্ট বিকজ দিস ইজ ইট উড বি ইজিয়ার ইফ আই কুড ডু দিস ইট পার্সন বাট if you could mute uh, if everybody could mute themselves during when i'm talking because otherwise there's a feedback and then uh, there's a problem in hearing so thank you very much and with that i will begin i will share my screen and then i'll start with uh, the presentation can okay So I think everybody can see my screen and I will begin. So what I'm going to talk today about is meiosis, the unique cell division that is regulating the continuity of life. Before I begin, I would like to give a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I will first talk about cell division in general. 
briefly discuss the difference between mitosis and meiosis, the two different types of cell division that take place in our bodies, then focus on meiosis and its different phases. And uh, then I would talk about the differences. As we know, meiosis happens in two places in our bodies, in spermatogenesis and oogenesis for the formation of gametes. And essentially, there's a difference. There's general meiosis and there's a uh, amount of difference in the actual process where it happens. So I will talk about that. And in the end, I will talk about what happens if meiosis is defective and what can these lead to. So with that, I have structured the talk a bit in, in a bit general manner. I am hoping that I'm able to carry everyone with me. So with all of your permission, I'll begin. So as we know, uh, every cell in our body goes through a cell cycle. So it, there is a G0 phase, which are terminally differentiated cells that withdraw from the cell cycle. But all these cells that are in the cell cycle undergo through these four phases that you can see. Um, I hope you can see my cursor. We go through the G1 phase, the S phase, the G2 phase, and the M phase, which is actually the div division phase or either mitosis or meiosis. So first, let me just briefly describe the different phases of the cell cycle. First, we have the re-entry point, a cell returning from G0 enters at early G1 phase. And the G1 phase is where we have RNA and protein synthesis, but no DNA synthesis. So the cell in this phase prepares itself to duplicate its DNA and also um, uh, it synthesizes RNA and protein in preparation for the division. We also have several checkpoints. I'm only just going to mention one. As you can see, there's a restriction point in G1 and a cell that passes this point is committed to pass into S phase. The S phase is very important because this is where the DNA synthesis occurs and the cell doubles the amount of DNA in the cell and um, just one second, let me just hide this and then you'll be able to see better. Uh, sorry. Um, just, yeah. So the S phase is DNA synthesis where the amount of DNA is doubled. RNA and protein synthesis also takes place, but in the background. This is followed by a G2 phase where there is no further DNA synthesis and there is more RNA and protein synthesis to prepare the cell for division. And as you can see from the cell cycle, the division phase is actually the smallest of all the phases of the cell cycle. It's the shortest in duration. Not quite, but in case of mitosis, mitosis it is. And then we have come to the types of cell division. The first is mitosis. Mitosis generally occurs in all our body cells. And this is a division in which a cell divides to make exact copies of itself. So it divides to form two exact copies of itself. The chromosomes are duplicated and then they separate to different poles and there is cytokinesis where the cell, uh, cytoplasm is divided and you have two new daughter cells which are identical in respect to the parent cell. But we also have a certain different type of division which is known as meiosis, which is what you can see now, in which the progeny of the cells that are formed are not the same as the parent cell. So what we have here is we have DNA duplication and then we have the first division in which the chromosome number is made half. So from a diploid number, which is like, for example, if you take the case of humans, humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes, which is called the diploid number. So after the first meiotic division, which you can see is till the end of here, we have two daughter cells, which now have half the number of chromosomes. And then there is another division phase, which... So there are two division phases, and in the second division phase, we end up with four daughter cells, or four uh, cells from the original parent cell, which now have the haploid number of chromosomes, or one set. And this is important because, as we know, that humans and other animals that reproduce sex, um, uh, have sexual reproduction, in this case, we have a gamete from the male, or the sperm, which fuses with the egg. So this reduction division is necessary to maintain the diploid number in the newly formed zygote, which will then give rise to the organism. So with this in mind, before I go any further with meiosis, I would like to clarify something. And this is something that I decided that I should do because when I was a student, this also confused me. And my teachers are present and they explained it to me. So I will try it. I will explain it very simply. So as you can see on the left, extreme left, we have a normal cell which has the diploid and we are, let me define here, we have chromosome number, which we are denoting with N, and we have DNA content, which we are defining as C. 
Uh, and I will tell you why this confusion occurs as I explain this slide. So here we have on the left a diploid cell, which say, for example, this organism has just two pairs of chromosomes. So its diploid number is two, and it, 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 it's what I have represented on the left because it's not possible to draw 46, for example, in humans. In this case, we have a cell which is diploid number, and it also has exactly the diploid content of DNA. Now, when it undergoes interface where DNA is duplicated, we still have a diploid number of chromosomes. And that is because the way chromosomes are defined is by counting the centromeres, which is the dot which holds these, the duplicated DNA together. So in this case, we have DNA that is duplicated. But since these duplicated chromosomes are still held together by one centromere, we define it that the number of chromosomes is still diploid but the DNA content is now four times or double the diploid number. What happens with mitosis is these chromosomes separate the centromere divide and each pair, like each duplicated chromosome, one goes to each pole. And what we land up is with two daughter cells that have the diploid chromosome number 2N and also the diploid DNA content, which is 2C. In the case of meiosis, after the first division, what happens is these, the centromere does not divide. So, the, each chromosome with its duplicated partner now moves to different cells. And so what we have is we have haploid chromosome numbers, but double the DNA content, diploid DNA content, which is what you can see here. And then there's a further division in which now the centromere divides, and then these uh, chromatids or and the haploid chromosomes go to separate poles, and then we end up with four daughter cells, which has haploid chromosome number and also haploid DNA content. And this is why meiosis is so interesting. So moving on from here, what is meiosis? A brief history of meiosis. It was described beginning in the 1870s where it was described in sea urchin. And this was expanded to chromosome migration. But it was only in 1905 that the term was coined. And only in 1911 that this was shown in Drosophila very definitively. Briefly, meiosis is a special type of cell division of germ cells in sexually reproductive organisms that are used to produce the gametes, such as the sperm or the egg cell. Meiosis consists of two rounds of chromosome segregation, which I explained in the previous slide, followed, which follows a single S, um, interface and S phase, which means there's only a single round of DNA replication. The first meiotic division is a reductional division because we go from diploid chromosome number to haploid chromosome number. So it's also called a heterotypic division. And the second meiotic division is an equational division. Because in this case, we just, we, the chromosome number remains the same. It's just diploid, it's uh, haploid to haploid. So it's called a homotypic division. And in diploid organisms, meiosis generates gametes with haploid number of chromosomes. So with that, let's take a brief overview of the process of meiosis. So, uh, it starts with interphase where the chromosome, uh, where the DNA duplicates and after the S phase, you have four times the DNA content or 4C, and that is represented by the four lines that you can um, see here. And then this undergoes prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one. It does uh, similar things in prophase, it aligns, and in metaphase, it aligns along the spindle. But the interesting thing that I will explain later is there is genetic recombination in prophase, which is why the meiosis also produces the end result, the chromosomes that are produced by meiosis are not identical to the parents. There is always genetic variation, which is why I have the title of my talk was Continuity of Life, because this is very important uh, variation for a species to evolve and exist. And then you have metaphase one where the chromosome align, and then you have anaphase where the chromosomes separate to different poles, followed by telophase one where there is cytokinesis. After this, the cell immediately enters into another phase of division, which is known as meiosis II. In this case, we also have a prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And at the end of this telophase, as you can see from if you follow the line, that you now have four daughter cells, each with a haploid number of chromosomes and the haploid amount of DNA, which depending on whether they're in males are sperm and in females are eggs, which can then go forward, fertilize, and then carry on the process of life. Uh, if we come to the phases of meiosis, which is what I want to describe uh, next, let us start with prophase one. Prophase one is the longest phase in meiosis. 
and it is divided into five subspaces. So it takes up the most amount of time because this is where most of the interesting stuff happens in meiosis. We begin with the first step, which is called leptity. In this, as you know, DNA is generally does not ex exist in the condensed form as chromosomes in a normal cell. Rather, they, they exist as long DNA. But during cell division, these DNA heterochromatinides condense and form the structures that we see as chromosomes. And the centrioles move to opposite poles, and there is a definite clustering of telomeres, which is a bouquet stage. So the telomeres associate with the nuclear membrane and form a kind of loop which resembles a flower bouquet. So there is also a stage here that is called leptity. What you see the image on the right is SYCP3 staining. Uh, SYCP3 is the synaptonemal complex protein, which is present along wherever these chromosomes are joined to each other. And that is what you see as a stain here. And that is, this, these images are from mine, but that's how a leptotein chromosome spread looks like. The next stage that we have is zygotein. In this case, there is pairing of homologous chromosomes. Now, what are homologous chromosomes? Homologous chromosomes are, say, if we take, for example, humans, if we take chromosome number 21, then we get one from our father and one from our mother. And homologous chromosomes are these pairs, one from each parent. And these chromosomes now pair. And this pairing is very specific. So each gene or each locus pairs specifically along the length of the chromosome. And then these pairs of synapse chromosomes are called bivalent. I have a picture which I can... Uh, and then three types of synapses, synapses are recognized. Proterminal, which begins from the end. Procentric, which begins from the center. And random, which means the pairing can start from anywhere. Uh, I have a picture here. Uh, where I'll just explain this first before I talk about packaging. So let us assume that the black comes from the father and the red comes from the mother. And they are like homologous chromosomes. So they are the same chromosome, but coming from either parent. And this point of that they come in close. Um, yes. Um, you can ask the question. I think somebody raised a hand. So I'll wait. Or should I continue? You need to unmute and ask the question, if, if, or, or is there a chat? We continue, Kaur, continue, Kaur. Okay, I will continue. Thank you. So in this case, we, what you can see here is, if we assume that the, continuing from where I left off, if we have the black chromosome comes from the father and the red one comes from the mother, then these come in close approximation, which is known as pairing. There is gene-to-gene -gene pairing. And this is called a bivalent. So what you can see here is a representation of the bivalent. And um, as you can see, example of here, though the, uh, this is before they come in close approximation in the picture that you can see right at the bottom of the screen. In PAC-IT, what happens is these bivalents condense further. And each bivalent now splits and is composed of four chromatids, which is called a tetra. So in this case, they have already split. So now they are a tetra. So you can see one, two, three, four, which is from you have the tetra. And there is crossing over and recombination. What is crossing over? Crossing over is where the pair, the par different parts of homologous chromosomes cross and they exchange genetic components. So you had a chromosome which was from your father and one from your mother, but during meiosis, these chromosomes exchange genetic material in between each other. So now you have a mosaic chromosome which is neither from either parent, either father or the mother, but is uniquely new, which is created in this step. And this is known as gen crossing over, which you can see here, because this forms a cross, an X, which is why it's called crossing over. And then there is recombination. So these, once they cross over, there's a double-stranded break in the DNA, and there is exchange of genetic materials between the different chromosomes, and then you have new chromosome forms. The point of exchange is called a chiasma, which is um, this point here. It's called a chiasma. Moving on from here, we have the next step, which is the, which is also part of prophase and it's called diplotene. In this case, if you have a look at the chromosomes here, if you compare it with what you just saw on the last slide, there has been exchange of genetic information. So the black is no longer completely black, it has parts of red, and the red is no longer completely red, it has parts of, um, uh, parts of um, black in it. And in this case, the homologous chromosomes now separate a bit. Now they were crossed over initially. Now they separate a bit, but they are still joined at the chiasma, which was the point of exchange. 
Now these sayasmaras start moving towards wherever the exchange took place. If you can see here, they are they are separated everywhere, but they are joined along where the exchange took place. Now this point of joining will start moving towards the terminal, towards the chromosome end, and then when you have diakinesis. The chromosome looks somewhat like this, where they are only joined at the terminal end. In this case, we say that the terminalization is complete. The chromosomes are only joined at the telomere, and the bi bivalents appear ring-like. I know my picture doesn't show it; shows more like a diamond, but just imagine that's a ring. Uh, the nuclear membrane disappears, the spindles form, and these bivalents and tetras are scattered irregularly in the cytoplasm. Uh, if you look at the image here, which is a stained uh, chromosome with DAPI. And as you can see here, it kind of resembles, they're only joined at the end. The black region is where there is nothing, which is the portion here, and this is the centromeres in both cases. And so after diakinesis, these chromosomes then enter metaphase. And when we have metaphase one, what happens is these bivalents arrange themselves in parallel equatorial plates. So if you see, if you have a look here, I've just drawn one chromosome for your convenience. They assemble on parallel plates. So one chromosome, one homologue is on one equatorial plane and the other is on another equatorial plane. And this is important because what we see here, the centrosome that attach to the spindles and are the arms of the chromosome is directed towards the center. There is no splitting of the centromere. And due to this, after metaphase one, as we will see in anaphase and telophase, each homologue moves to one pole, which is how you end up with the haploid number. What you see here is, a, again, a DAPI spread of chromosomes, which is from the uh, metaphase plate, where they are arranged on the equator. And what you see with the, if you remember, the SYCB3 is the point of synapse. We were seeing long staining before, but in this case, because the terminalization is complete, the, there are only comes at points which represents the terminal points where the chromosomes are still attached. Then we move to anaphase one. Anaphase one, the homologous chromosome moves towards opposite pole. If you have a look at this figure here, you can see that this is one homologous chromosome and this is the other. I, and they have undergone genetic recombination and each moves to a different pole, which is why you have, you end up at the end of meiosis one with haploid number of chromosomes. There is a reduction of chromosome number, which is called disjunction. Remember the term because non-disjunction or where this reduction does not take place can lead to complexities, which we will discuss later. Unlike mitosis, where the centromere split, here, as I said, each chromosome contains two sister chromatids, which are attached to a sin, uh, single centromere. As you can see on the image on the top panel here, this is the metaphase plate, this is the spindle, and this is how they are arranged at the end of metaphase one. And finally, they are pulled to different poles, and at the end of anaphase, this is how they look like. Finally, we have the telophase and cytokinesis. Now, normally what happens when in mitosis, this is the end, so the chromosomes decondense, and become thread-like structures again. In meiosis, you have to remember there's another division left. So in this case, complete decondensation may not occur. The nuclear membrane does reform. You have two daughter cells with haploid chromosome number. Moving on from here, we now enter the next phase of meiosis, which is called meiosis two, which is the equational division. You have prophase. So again, chromosome condensation occurs. There is centro and here the important thing is the centromere duplicates. So now these uh, uh, sister chromatids, the centromere divides, duplicates, and is, they are now attached, like we have seen in meiosis, where the centromere is attached and the arms point towards the pole. And interestingly, we have always seen that the spindle that is formed in meiosis uh, 2 is always 90 degrees to the spindle that is formed in meiosis 1. And I have just drawn the chromosomes just so that you can follow. You can uh, follow them from the diagram. Then there is metaphase 2. Chromosomes are arranged at the equator. Each centromere is joined by, so each centromere, which is now duplicated, is joined by chromosomal fibers on both sides, and the centromeres are aligned on the equator with the chromatids towards the pole. What you can see here is an example of how a staining, tubulin, which is the spindle, and H2B, which is the histone, which forms the backbone of the chromosome. And then you have anaphase two. Centromere splits, daughter chromosomes are back to opposite poles, as you can see here. And then at the end of telophase two and cytokinesis, we now end up with four daughter cells that has haploid number of chromosomes and haploid DNA content. I will just bring back the original chromosomes from the parent cell. As you can understand, if you see here, duplicated, there was existence, there was exchange of genetic material, and you now have these four which are not really identical to what we have from the parents. 
So with that, we have to, we've, I've discussed the phases of meiosis. But where does meiosis take place in our body? Let's consider humans in this case. There are two places where meiosis takes place. One is spermatogenesis, and the other is um, oogenesis. Now, as I like to say, humans are complicated individuals, and we really like our bodily systems to be very simple. So let's look at how different it is. I have described general meiosis, but let's now take a look at how different it is when we actually go into the places where it occurs in our body. Beginning with, let's talk about spermatogenesis. Now, spermatogenesis, obviously, we know what it is. And then I have a picture here which shows the process of meiosis in spermatogonia. We begin with spermatogonia, which is the stem cell, which can, is capable of mitotic self-renewal, which is what is shown by this arrow here. And then it also transforms to form spermatogonia B, which enters meiosis to give rise to sperm. We've just described the process, so I won't go into it, but just telling you that the spermatogonia B, before it enters meiosis, it undergoes clonal expansion. And these cl different, uh, by clonal expansion means it divides and divides. But the interesting fact to note here is that these cells are all joined by cytoplasmic bridges. They are, the complete cytokinesis does not occur. And this is a way you can transfer materials between the cells. A body is a very optimal system, so it works towards optimization of the process. And this helps in several regards, because then you don't really, you have a passage from each cell to cell, and each cell does not have to function as an autonomous unit. These cells then undergo meiosis 1, or enter meiosis 1 as spermatocytes. Then these form spermatocytes, which under, after meiosis 1, and then after meiosis 2, you form round spermatids. And these are still connected. So there is exchange of genetic information or like RNA and other proteins across this. So, so if you begin with one spermatogonia B, so, and say it gives, by clonal expansion, it gives rise to four cells, then these four cells will give rise to uh, eight spermatocyte one, and then exponentially it will keep increasing. And all the progeny from a single spermatogonium B are connected by cytoplasmic bridges. Till the final maturation occurs and the sperm is formed, as you can see here. Let's take a look just at the different cell types. So you have here, which is the spermatogonial stem cell. This is capable of self-renewal, but then it undergoes division and gives rise to spermatogonium B, which then enters the meiotic phase. And then it goes from spermatogonium B to spermatocyte. And then finally, it gives rise to the round spermatid. And then the round spermatid then keeps there is no further synthesis transcription or translation from this point. And then this round spermatid keeps on going through the process of maturation, which is called spermiogenesis, to finally give rise to the motile sperm, which sheds most of its cytoplasm, just as the nuclear material and the mitochondria, so that it moves. So this is very interesting because you would normally expect a cell to retain its cytoplasm. So the sperm does not really require its cytoplasm so much. It just requires energy to move up the female genital tract. So it just it keeps the tail, it keeps its mitochondria, and it keeps the genetic material. And we'll see how different this is from the oocyte. Now, spermatogenesis does not happen if, in a vacuum. So we discuss meiosis, but it's not like the cells are floating anywhere. It's a very tightly regulated process. And as we can see from here, these cells actually progress or undergo meiosis while in tight junctions between the Sertoli cells. So the entire testis is surrounded by, a, uh, or the seminiferous tubules are surrounded by a basement membrane. And then you have the Sertoli cell, which forms a blood testis barrier. So the sperm never comes into contact with our blood or with the blood from the person who's producing the sperm. And as you can see here, I've labeled all the different cells. I sure you all know, I won't go through it very um, in detail, but as you can see here, there's, this is a Sertoli cell and this is a Sertoli cell. And the spermatogonium is near the basement membrane, and these go undergo meiosis towards and then mature to form a sperm. And as it does, it moves from the basement membrane towards the lumen, and finally the sperm is embedded in the Sertoli cell, and finally released into the lumen, where it has to undergo several more processes to uh, undergoing capacit cap capacitation, sorry, and then it can uh, be ejaculated. So in this, I would now come to this. 
section here, which is actually from my PhD, where I used to work with human uh, patient samples. And I would like to point out the different cell types that I was talking to you. I put the diagram in the bottom as your uh, as a recipe. And so first we have what you see here, that is the basement membrane, which is here. Then you have the spermatogonial stem cells, which are the ones that are here, which are closed. Uh, sorry, this is the Sertoli cell. This is the Sertoli cell nucleus, excuse me. And as you can see, the entire, uh, entire lumen is actually surrounded by Sertoli cells. Next, we have the spermatogonia, which is like right next to the basement membrane. And then the next state we have is the spermatocytes. These are actually packeted spermatocytes, and hence their nucleus is large, and you can actually make out the chromosomes, which are condensed, almost like a beta structure, even in this. Then we have elongating spermatids, which is there, and you also have round spermatids. So round spermatids and then elongating spermatids. And finally, the lumen is here, the sperm will be embedded and this is, uh, and it can be, goes to the tubules and moves out of the testis. So this is a cross section from an actual human uh, testis. So I'm glad that I could show this to you. And then, sorry, we move on. That spermatogenesis is also a very complex process. And the reason I'm saying this is we have to see that meiosis, as I described, seems very simple. But the way it actually happens in the body it does not always follow the set pattern. It becomes more and more complex. And just to give you a brief idea about how complex it is, this is an experiment which was done in almost 1963, 1964, in which they traced the uh, progress of the from uh, spermatogenesis from spermatogonium to sperm by injecting uh, radioactive thymidine. And as you can see here, it takes almost 74 days for one spermatogonium to become a motile sperm. And it's interesting because each one, as it progresses to the next step, it also moves up from the basement membrane towards the lumen. And then another uh, spermatogonium starts developing. So if you take a cross section, you can see that several different cell types are associated with each other, which is known as staging. And if you have an example here, a spermatogonium will be, will be a um, uh, spermatogonia stem cell will be associated with the spermatogonium B, which will be associated with the packaging spermatocyte, which will be associated with the round spermatid, and then a motile sperm. And this is called stages of human spermatogenesis. Now, the last point that I want to say about spermatogenesis is, if you take a seminiferous tubule of a rat, and if you put it on a slide and you take a cross section, what is observed is that there are alternate light and dark sections. And wherever you take a cross section, if you look at the lumen, Every cell in that um, cross section will be of the same stage or will belong to one of these associations uh, that I mentioned on the left, which I'm now showing with my cursor. Humans, as I said, we love complications. So not only is human spermatogenesis complicated, but human spermatogenesis also progresses along the length of the tubule in a helical fashion, which you can see here. So when you take a cross section of the seminiferous tubule of humans, you will see in a single cross-section more than one stage, which also makes staging very difficult. With this, I would um, go on and talk about the other complex uh, pro um, uh, system in our body where this process of meiosis takes place, which is oogenesis. And before I say anything about how oogenesis, meiosis and oogenesis is different, let me just show you this slide. We have a primordial follicle, which in this case is the initial diploid cell that will undergo meiosis. This go undergoes meiosis, becomes a primary follicle, growing follicle, mature follicle, and then there is ovulation. Now, I, if this was interactive, I would have waited for an answer, but I'll just say this. It's interesting that we learned or we talked about how meiosis produces four daughter cells. And as you can see in this case, we just have one egg. So what happened to the other three? And that is kind of like the complexity of oogenesis. This is what happens. First, there is oogenesis happens before birth. So you initially, when the fetus is developing, you have the oogonium, which is the stem cell that will give rise to the oocyte. And these cells en masse enter meiosis. And then they are all arrested at prophase one. And this arrest is maintained from when a female uh, is born to puberty. So uh, the entire reproductive cycle of a female is determined even before she is born. 
because the number of eggs that will mature and enter into the reproductive cycle or will form a mature oocyte are determined before birth. So there are millions of um, cells which undergo meiosis and there is massive death and then there are like some 100,000 or more which are there before birth. And these cells remain arrested in prophase one. Can you imagine they are all joined together, there is synapse, there is recombination, and then everything stops. And you have to maintain it in this suspended animation for almost 12 to 13 years or 11, in that, an average of 11 years from birth to puberty. During puberty, with every menstrual cycle, these, the arrest of one uh, or primary oocyte is released, one in case of humans, a little more in the case of other animals. And then what happens is this one primary oocyte completes meiosis one. And interestingly, instead of forming two daughter cells, one of these retains most of the cytoplasm and it's called the secondary oocyte. And a haploid chromosome number and very little of the cytoplasm is put into another cell, which is called the first polar body, which dies. Now this again enters meiosis two and is again arrested. Oh, sorry, it enters meiosis two and at metaphase two, is again arrested, which is when ovulation occurs. This ov uh, arrest of me meiosis in metaphase 2 will only be released if this egg is fertilized. Otherwise, as we know, the next menstrual cycle begins, this is shed and it's lost. If and only if this oocyte is fertilized, then this uh, egg undergoes complete meiosis 2 and releases a second polar body, which again dies, and now we land up with one oocyte, which has the haploid number of chromosomes. With that, so oocyte is, oogenesis is way more complicated than spermatogenesis, which is why there are several more complications associated with oogenesis. But that does not mean there are no defects associated with spermatogenesis, and I'll come to that. With that, I would like to move on to some unique features of female meiosis. One, if you remember, we talked about how the centrosome forms the anchor of the spindle. In oocytes, there is no centrosome. It's an acentrosome spindle formation. It consists of uh, uh, mTORC and microtubules. And this is what happens. I just described what is known as the asymmetric cell division, in which you release three polar bodies and they all die, and you end up with one egg from one spermatogonium, uh, sorry, from one oogonium. So in this case, we don't have four daughter progeny, we just land up with one. And the other one is the long prophase one array. And let me sh show you some images which will make this clear. This is an example of the acentrosome spindle formation. As you can see, this is spindle is not formed here. As you can see, it's not formed in the center of the cell. It's formed towards the pole. And these are examples of chromosome spreads. And if I go to the next slide, you can see what happens is in prophase one, metaphase one, the spindle is formed towards one pole. It's not formed in the center. And after anaphase one, most of the very most of the cytoplasm and haploid number is retained in one, and the other one it is just extruded out. And in this case, you have pro metaphase two and then metaphase two, and again another polar body is released when you have fertilization, and then it goes on and so forth. Now I would like to show you an image. This is a live image taken of an oocyte. If you look at the one on the left, this is where you see an oocyte which is undergoing the first polar body it will release its first polar body. So just have a look, you can observe it somewhere around here where it will release its polar body. And as you can see, there's an asymmetric cell division. Most of the cytoplasm is retained and only the uh, a small polar body is released, which is almost like very small compared to the oocyte. In this case, we label the DNA and you can have a look at what happens. Yeah, and you can see most of the cytoplasm and a haploid number is retained, and on the other side, you have a small polar body. With that, um, sorry, yes. What happens, I will just briefly recapitulate the process that I said in pictures. So you have the germinal vesicle, then you have GVBD, which is germinal vesicle breakdown, which is basically just maturing, and then you have the release of the first polar body. And in this case, what happens is these cells are initially arrested before this in, um, prophase one, and then once during, uh, after puberty during a menstrual cycle, one oocyte matures and it releases its first polar body. And then it is arrested again at metaphase two and then it needs fertilization. This is a video that I have, which uh, 
I will play in which you can see an oust site is surrounded by sperm. So the small things that are wriggling about, I don't know whether it's very clearly visible, and which are moving the oust sites are the sperm, which you can see um, in this case. Um, sorry, I lost my cursor, but I guess you can. Okay, I found it again. You can see the sperm, and then what happens is there is fertilization. So in that case. The second polar body is shed, the first polar body is there, which starts disintegrating, which you can see here, with the arrow, which is the lower arrow, and the second polar body is released. And then you have post-fertilization, which is when the, the sperm nucleus and the egg nucleus are together in one cell, which is called pronuclei, and they, which you can see here. This is a cell that has been just fertilized. You can see the two dots, which represent the two nuclei. And then this follows into the formation of a zygote, to the two cell stage and the four cell stage. These images have all been taken from mice, but the process is similar. With that, I have described meiosis. I have described the different places in the human body where meiosis takes place. So the next step obviously is, it's such a complicated process. What happens when it fails? And there are defects in meiosis. So the end result of a failure of meiosis is infertility. And if you can see in this graph, this is countries by fertility rate, and especially European countries have low fertility as compared to the African countries have the most fertility. Fertility, because in this case, we are considering the number of children per woman, live birth. And with that, you can see there is a disparity among different populations about how fertile or less fertile they are. And with that in mind, it's a mis common misconception that the infertility is mainly a problem for females. It's not. The male factor and the female factor com com like can equally contribute to the infertility issue, which we can see this is data source from IVF clinics in India. And with that, this is a graph which shows you if we talk about first male infertility and defects in spermatogenesis, this is a map which shows you that the percentage contribution of the male infertility factor to all infertility cases. And as you can see, in Asia, it comprises about 37%. In the Middle East, it is as high as 60 to 70%, and so on and so forth. And then, if we have look at the different factors that can cause, there can be immune system factors. If you remember, I mentioned the blood test is barrier. So that is important. If by chance there is a meningitis and the blood test is barrier is destroyed, or there is some kind of surgical leakage or injury, that can lead to a loss in spermatogenesis. There can be several physical problems like torsion where the test is twisted, but then can, there can also be problems in meiosis. And just the various types of male infertility, I will not go into this in detail, but there are semen characteristics which determine what type of infertility is there, which uh, ranges from aspermia, which means no ejaculate, to azospermia, which means no sperm in ejaculate, to normospermia, which is normal semen profile and infertility of an unknown etiology. Now, I have some work that I did during my PhD, which I think would be interesting to look here. We have normal humans for pantogenesis. And if you take tubules and you make a single cell suspension, and you just look at the DNA content of these cells under by using flow cytometry, which is the graph on the right side, you can see that the three graphs here represent haploid DNA content, or C, uh, 2C, and 4C. These are the three peaks that represent it. And when there is normal spermatogenesis, you would have you would have cells in every state. So you would see most cells with C DNA content or haploid cells, and you would see diploid cells with two C DNA content. And you would also see the cells that have undergone interface and in between, which have four C DNA content or most lethal meiosis too. And this is normal spermatogenesis. But what happens if this doesn't happen? So let's take a look at two cases: meiotic arrest and premeiotic arrest. Let me first start with meiotic arrest. If you look at the profile here, you immediately notice the difference from the last profile. There is no cells with the haploid DNA content. And if you look at the cross-section, if you remember the different stages when I pointed it out from my earlier slide, all you can see here is cells that are arrested in pacitine. You can see no spermatids, no elongating spermatids, no transpermatids. And the most interesting fact is there is no lumen. You can see the basement membrane up here. You can see the spermatic on your stem cells, but there is no lumen. So this is an example of a meiotic arrest in human spermatogenesis. The next one is a premeiotic arrest. In this case, if you look, there are almost no cells. And if you have a look at the profile, you mainly have a diploid content and very little 4C, which is almost negligible, 
and no haploid DNA content cells. And as you can see here, the architecture is lost. There is ingression from the basement membrane. There is no Sertoli cell which forms a barrier, and you can see the cells are scattered about. So this is an example of a premiatic arrest in humans, and these are mostly from my PhD work and um, from my PhD lab. And then let's move on from here to female infertility or defects in meiosis in females. So if you can see, there are a lot of other causes. Meiosis is not the only factor, but there is a lot of factors which depends on meiosis. And if you remember, meiosis is arrested in females for a really long time. 12 years it has to be maintained in the same situation. And then with increasing age, it means that say the oocyte which, which enters the first menstrual cycle has been arrested for 13 years. But say then if we consider that puberty began at 12, then if the, when the woman is 25, then that oocyte that enters the menstrual cycle when she's at 25 has actually been arrested for 25 years before that. And these obviously gives rise to a lot of complexity. So as I come to the, let me show you some examples or some microscoping images, which I think would be nice. In that case is misalignment. This is what you can see on the top panel, a normal alignment where the chromosomes are aligned along the equatorial plate and metaphase can continue. In the other case, due to some defects, there is the alignment is not proper. So they are scattered and until unless these chromosomes align, the division will not go forward. If it never aligns, then probably the cell will die and you will not have a mature oocyte. Misattached chromosome. Now remember, when we were talking in initial meiosis, we said there is disjunction, which means homologous chromosomes move to different poles. But if you can see here, this is from anaphase one, uh, metaphase one of an oocyte. These two chromosomes, the both homologues are attached to one pole, which means that these chromosomes will move to an, the same pole. This also gives rise to something else, which I'll describe in the next slide. But this is an example of misattached chromosomes where you can see here, there is no fibers from this pole, which are attached to this pair of homologues. And you can see clearly here, both centromeres are attached to one side. Then we have unstable spindle. You remember I showed you a spindle that forms. In this case, as you can see, the misalignment is also because the spindle is not stable. And we have chromosomes scattered everywhere. The spindle is not compact as it should be. And this is another example. And the last example that I would say before I come to the end of my topic is aneuploidy. What you see here is mice, which have 20 chromosomes. And as you can see here, they have 20 chromosomes. But this is another spread where there is 21, 22, 23, which means it has three extra chromosomes. And then the other one, it has only 19. So this is an example of non disjunction or where homologues don't move to the same pole. And we know some diseases that we know in humans, for example, the trisomy of the 21st chromosome, which can give rise to Down syndrome, the Turner syndrome, which in which the there is an XO, there is no uh, chromosome missing from one parent, so either the Y or the X. And then we have an additional extra chromosome, which is Klein Salter, in which it has two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. And what you can see here are chromosome karyotyping from actual disease individuals. And with that, um, I come to my, this is my kind of last slide. So I would say, first I would say thank you. And then I would say, I hope to give you a brief idea of how complex my, my, uh, meiosis is and why it is essential for the continuity of life because it forms the gametes, the sperm and the egg. And also how what we study is the general process and how it differs in when it actually happens in the human body. So I would finally like to thank everybody for listening to me and for paying attention and briefly mention a few people. Firstly, Government General Degree College Shingur, Faculty of Zoology, and Shan Professor Shantanu Chakraborty, who's also my teacher, for giving me this opportunity to present and speaking. My present lab, my uh, PI, uh, Professor Ross Yesberger, and every member of the lab for helping me to make presentations. I ask them for, and especially uh, Dr. Steven Michel and Dr. Nabi, for providing me with a lot of images because I work with mammatogenesis, not really eugenesis. Um, so they provided me with a lot of images and videos that I've shown you today. Uh, Professor Rajan Dighe and my lab, which was my PhD lab from IIST, where I have shown you some images from, and it was a training experience with which I am now working. Uh, Mrs. Gora, who was my teacher, who just gave, made me love biology, which is why I'm still working with it after almost, 
I don't know, 15 years. And all my teachers, colleagues, and students who are listening to my presentation, thank you for your attention. And with that, I would stop the presentation and I'm open for any questions. So thank you. And hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Orko. It was a wonderful deliberation. Oshadharan hoyche, tarun laglo amade shobar. Asha kori student rao kub bhalo gujeche. And uh, really, means uh, you have done a wonderful work, no doubt. You have used uh, all kinds of protein biochemistry, microscopy, shop rakhomer kaj to be kuresho. And uh, students have really, they have, you know, they had a first hand experience. Actual image, how the meiotic uh, meiosis happens in uh, human body, uh, you have shown that. Now, uh, I would appreciate if Karu uh, student, Karu, many teachers, uh, we have several teachers amongst us. If anybody has any question, uh, you can ask or go directly, you can write in the chat box or you can. Uh, uh, after a mic down, Kore, you can also ask him directly if you wish. Orko, I am Shoykot sir. Because you are my uncle, so Monen, you are the one who is a student. Okay, video down, Kore, I am telling you, Monen, please. Video down, Kore. No, no, I am Monen. Okay. Video down, Kore. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's আচ্ছা আমি যেটা জিজ্ঞেস করার আছে অর্ককে সেটা হচ্ছে এই যে ড্রসোফিলাই আমরা যেরকম প্রায় 100 বছর আগে আবিষ্কার হয়েছে এটা তো মিওটিক ড্রাইভ কনসেপ্টটা আছে দা ফেনোমেনন অফ মিওটিক ড্রাইভ মানে যে বলা যেতে পারে তুমি যেহেতু এই কন্টিনিউটি লাইফ নিয়ে বলছো কন্টিনিউটি অফ লাইফ নিয়ে তো এই ড্রসোফিলাই যেরকম মিওটিক ড্রাইভটা অ্যাকচুয়ালি হয়তো অনেক ড্রসবিলো অবস্কিউরাতে প্রথম হয়েছিল আর কি প্রথম ধরা পড়েছিল তারপর অন্য ড্রসবিলাতেও দেখা গেছে তো এরকম হিউম্যানে কি রকম মিউটিক ড্রাইভ হয় কারণ আমরা অনেক ফ্যামিলি দেখেছি এরকম ইনফ্যাক্ট আমাদের নিজেদের ফ্যামিলি তো এরকম আছে আর কি যে যেখানে বেশ কিছু ফ্যামিলি আছে যেখানে মেয়ের সংখ্যা অনেক বেশি আবার কিছু ফ্যামিলি আছে যেখানে মেয়ের সংখ্যা খুব কম এবং সব কটাতে ইনফ্যান্টিসাইডের কেস তা কিন্তু না মানে মানে এইরকম তুমি যেহেতু এইটা নিয়ে পড়াশোনা করেছো তাই বলছি যে এরকম কি কোনো স্টাডি হয় प्रचुर I don't know whether there's a study on myotic drive because I am not or don't know that I've never come across it. But I mean, when I understand which point you're referring to, but it's very difficult to analyze. Karan, I work with infertility and I work with male infertility, which is like a big taboo. And our other problem was that we could not do any genetic or analysis because people when undergoing surgery gave us permission to take their samples. But most people did not sign a disclosure form that allowed us to go back to them to ask questions. So they were like, sample the lamp into Proshno Gotte Bargana. And because until unless many, this infertility comes out of the taboo, I'm not sure how easy or how many it will be to get data on this because we can't use data when there is like money. We had a problem when our mother actually, Dokonami Pepata Patio Chilam, our reviewers are, why don't you have follow up data? And we had to show them that they couldn't. We had 125 patients participating in our study, and only three of them signed a non-disclosure form. Money. Three of them said, "You're, you're, you can come back to us and ask questions, or you can contact me for further information." So I don't. Money. To answer to your question is, I don't think something exists. But meiosis is money. Not meiosis in general, but human reproduction is still not very well understood because mostly, if you look at fertility graphs, there's an enormous percentage, about 10 to 15 percent. That akun amra idiopathic baan explain bolle chalay because we really I don't think we really know what is going on so that would be my answer at this point so, thank you for the question thank you thank you thank you Orko in your uh, presentation uh, if you remember there is one uh, slide where you showed that India and China they have a male infertility of around 37 percent if I am not uh, wrong 
and probably you said uh, you have said that the middle east they have 60 to 70 percent uh, male infertility rate right you have uh, in your slide you have shown that so um, uh, such large ah right. uh, yeah means if it is for heat if yeah. i may you then africa te to aro beshi temperature mane mane no 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 this is this is okay firstly that slide is is slightly different mane that slide was that that of total infertility cases what uh -huh. is the num percentage that are affected by male infertility so okay, okay. 60% of total infertility cases are affected in the middle east by male infertility and okay. this again comes back to my previous answer is mm -hmm. because this mane uh, this data that i showed also says you cannot get males to come in for actual analysis so they have club unexplained they have club where it is established and they have also club where the male uh, the male partner does not come in for any checkup under male infertility because they have so in, in most cases the female partner is checked and you cannot assert an infertility but the male partner refuses to come in for a checkup which is why the numbers are so high in the middle east because it's again male infertility is still a taboo in most cultures except probably very advanced european a few countries in europe but it's still a taboo it's a so, published uh, scientific data right Means, yes uh, yes yes so they have clubbed the 67 percentage consists of males who have come and been examined okay. and are found in fertile Okay, and among yes. among the male patients that have been examined, are there more than seventy percent? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Of all fertility clinics, I misunderstood. I misunderstood. Oh, okay. no, no, no. Okay. 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 আমি পিকেস বলছি অর্ক হ্যাঁ বলুন স্যার কি যে ইউ हैव ডিসকাস দা মাই টপিক মেসেজ ইন এ ভেরি লুসিড ম্যানার এন্ড ইন এ ভেরি এই স্যার এর লাইন কেটে গেছে বোধহয় আর রূপেন্দ্র স্যার রয়েছেন দেবজানি এন্ড দা দেবজানি একটু ভিডিও অন করে এসো इंडिया जेने I did a genetic analysis of what are the contributors for uh, male infertility during my PhD. But what is, I uh, mean, one of the main reasons would be advanced age in both cases. Because at least for the urban population, rural population, it is a bola, or that is easy noy. But urban population, it says there is an advanced paternal age, advanced maternal age, and both of them actually adversely affect fertility income, I mean, outcomes. And um, also, what happens is, I mean. injury which i said blood test is very other is so important people don't understand and sometimes mane due to surgical spill or even just injury they don't treat it or they don't see it and then they have literally mane amar ami erokom sample o dekhechi where there are there were autoimmune antibodies in blood we analyzed the blood and then we saw completely empty testes jar ekta ami slide dekhalam mane kichu nei tubule tar modhe shudhu spermatogonium diye ache to orokom o dekhechi so several factors but increasing age ar ami bolbo an mane lack of treatment because it's a taboo mane jokhon treat korle hoyto hoto mane torsion e blood flow kome geche but if you don't go for treatment then it cannot be corrected and once the cells are dead you can't do anything Achha. so eta kichu ta ami bolbo amar ekhane internet e khub problem hocche ami just tomake je proshno ta korte jacchila seta ekটু shone nao ha byapar ta hocche je tumi meiosis somporke besh sundor kore bolle এবং আমার বিশ্বাস যে ছেলে মেয়েরা বুঝতে পারলো ভালো করতে 
এখন ব্যাপারটা হচ্ছে আমার মনে হয় ছেলে মেয়েরা যারা শুনছে তারা খুব ভালোই বুঝতে পারতো এবং যেটা বলার সেই সম্পর্কে যদি অর্ক একটু ছেলে মেয়েদের বলে আদার <laughs> factors also which is also controlled by ultimate legit one of such factors is thought that you know very well is there any imbalance mm. in the home which is responsible for the uh, fulfillment or full completion of the meiotic process sita kintu bolai to jodi keu jante chaye ba serokom jodi kono latest information jana thake seta bolle pore amader okay i mean uh, i'll try and answer sir আমার এত ভালো লাগছে যে আজকের এই সাকসেস হয়ে গেল আর কি আমার এই প্রোগ্রামটা আমি ঢুকেছিলেন স্যার কোথায় গেলেন কমলদাকে আর দেখতে পেলাম না আমি পিজুস স্যারের প্রশ্নটার উত্তরটা ছোট্ট করে দিচ্ছি and not a single gene there are like every step i mean ekta slide ami chilo but ami explain korini every step e there have been identified at least three or four uh, genes that are crucial or essential for the process jemon for double strand break repair there are genes like spo11 and other genes which control it tarpor ligation er shomoy there is another set of genes so it's a concerted effort of several genes over time and je kono ekta fail korle there can be a failure of meiosis so which is why i find this cell division very interesting because it's extremely extremely controlled if anyone wants mane there is a mane at a there is a graph that i like jekhane pray 1000 ta gene er naam ache which all points towards me but which is why it is very difficult to pinpoint one or two candidates and also the second part of the question is there are several factors environmental hormonal which yes. in the end is transmitted down and is affected by gene So it is a complex process. I did not talk about regulation, but if anybody is interested, read about the regulation of meiosis. Amar, I think my thesis is also online, which has a part on it. But I would be willing to contact, like if anybody writes me a mail or wants to know something, I'd be willing to reply to that as well. So, Cheta, you may go. Okay, in our mind, we have a lot of money. 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 তাহলে একটা মার ছেলের দেখাও হয়ে যায় এরকম ভাবে আমাদের সবার সঙ্গে আমি ইনভাইট করবো ওনাকে আমি সর্বিচ্ছার মাধ্যমে ওকে ওনাকে জানিয়েছিলাম উনি চন্দননগর গভর্নমেন্ট কলেজে আছে যদি এখন একটুখানি আমাদের সামনে আসেন তাহলে খুব ভালো লাগবে গুড ইভিনিং ম্যাডাম গুড ইভিনিং আনমিউট করতে হবে 
শুধু ভালো লাগলে একটু বলি অর্থ একটু সেটা হচ্ছে আসলে তুই তো চাইছিস যে একটা টাইমের মধ্যে পুরো ব্যাপারটা বলতে তো ম্যাডাম যেটা বলছেন সেটা হচ্ছে হ্যাঁ একটু ফাস্ট অবশ্যই উনি যেটা বললেন যখন ও ছোট ছিল যখন ও বৌদেরকে পড়িয়েছি সবাই খুব ভালো লাগছে আমি ব্যস্ত আমার সময় নেই এবং আমি পারবো না এই তিনটে কথা যেন না বলা হয় যাই হোক মানে এটা 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 হচ্ছে আমার মানে <laughs> কিছু কি ডিফারেন্স আসে মানে প্রোটিন প্রোটিন স্ট্রাকচার এর বা প্রোটিন স্টেইনিং এ না ডিফারেন্স আসে মানে প্রথম কথা হচ্ছে তুমি লাস্ট স্লাইড ওয়াজ আ ক্রোমোজোম স্প্রেড এন্ড দ্য সাইনাপটোনিমাল কমপ্লেক্স স্টেইনিং ইফ ইটস অন আ ক্রোমোজোম স্প্রেড ইটস স্লাইটলি डिफरेंट फ्रॉम व्हेन यू डू अ होल माउंट বা হোল স্টেইনিং ইন दैट केस देयर आर মানে স্ট্রাকচারে ডিফারেন্স তা কনফোকাল লেভেলে বোঝা যায় না but what we can see on mane depending on uh, mane function there is change in localization and mane i there are several images that i dekha ni mane when we know a protein affect uh, how it works then there are mane specific function mane erokom kore kore differ kore mane how we see the spot mane jokhon double stranded break hoy tokhon jemon mane double stranded break repair na hole it's all over the place mane instead of mane providing structures it is just like a background erokom hoy ক্ষেত্রে <laughs> <laughs> আমি 
মানেটোপ্লাজম <laughs> So it does not make sense to provide four small cells because the newly formed zygote, all its functions, all its mRNA, meaning maternal inheritance that I'm going to say, everything including mitochondria energy has to come from the two sides. That is why evolutionarily they have selected that there is great, the larger the animal, the lesser number of oocytes that mature per cycle and it is a single oocyte. Meaning, chances of survival, meaning optimization is an evolution towards the best reproductive success. Best reproductive mice success. Have, mice have like six to seven uh, pups per liter. They can take a tiger again, they can take a chart. They can take a human, the elephant, the ape, generally one. One. So it's kind of evolution towards reproductive success. One of the chances of missing out. Best self-selected. Thank you. Thank you very much. সুশান্ত স্যার কে ডাকছি সুশান্ত স্যার হচ্ছেন আমাদের ডিপার্টমেন্টের সিনিয়র এসোসিয়েট প্রফেসর সত্যি খুব সুন্দর একটা অনুষ্ঠান আমরা শুনলাম এবং দেখলাম ইন দিস করোনা টাইম সবচেয়ে সহজ হয়েছে যেটা সেটা হচ্ছে যে ফর্ম দূর দূর প্রান্তে বসে থেকেও কাছে আসতে পারছি এটা একটা সুযোগ করে দিয়েছে করোনা এর ফলে কি হচ্ছে আমরা আজকে এই সেমিনারটা শুনতে গেলে আমাকে ওকে অর্ককে হয়তো আসতে হতো এসে কোন একটা ইনস্টিটিউটে কোনো ভাবে সেমিনার দিতে হতো সেখানে আমরা যেতাম বা যে নাও জানতে পারতাম শুনতাম হ্যাঁ সেখানে রেজিস্ট্রেশন করতে হতো অনেক কিছু করতে কিন্তু বাট ইন ইন দিস কেস হোয়াট হ্যাপেন দ্যাট ডিউ টু দ্য কোভিড পিরিয়ড ছাত্রছাত্রীদের জন্য উপযোগী হলো তেমনি আরো অনেকটাই ক্লিয়ার হয়েছে আমাদের কাছে আশা করি ছাত্রছাত্রীরা উপকৃত হয়েছে এখানে সামাজিক আস্পেক্টটা যদি আমরা ভাবি অর্কর যে লেকচারটা দিয়েছে সেখানে আমি দেখেছি আমাদের সমাজে এবং শুধু আমার ভারতীয় সমাজে না অনেক জায়গাতে অনেক সমাজে এটা আছে হয়তো এই যে মেল ইনফার্টিলিটি ব্যাপারটা বলছে যখন নাকি বিয়ে হয়ে একটি মেয়ে যখন শ্বশুরবাড়িতে যায় এটা আমার নিজের চোখেও দেখা মানে দেখা আমার যে সেখানে মেয়ে ছেলেটি ইনফার্টাইল কিন্তু শ্বশুরবাড়ি শ্বশুর শাশুড়ি তারা কিছুতেই মানছে না যে আমার ছেলে ইনফার্টাইল আমি বইয়ের উপর অত্যাচার অবিচার এবং এরপর কি হচ্ছে বলছে আমার ছেলেকে আমি আবার বিয়ে দেবো আমার বিয়ে দেবো তো তোমার জন্য আমার বংশ বিস্তার হচ্ছে না এই যে ব্যাপারগুলো ফলে এই মেল ফার্টিলিটি ব্যাপারটা ইনফার্টিলিটি ব্যাপারটা কিন্তু আরো সচেতনতা আরো প্রচার করা দরকার আরো বৃদ্ধি করা দরকার আমার যেটা মনে হয়েছে কারণ আমি এই জিনিসগুলো আমি দেখেছি সামাজিক আস্পেক্টে না সত্যি আজকে অর্কর লেকচারটা খুব সুন্দর লাগলো এবং আমি অর্ককে ধন্যবাদ জানাই ওর ব্যস্ততার মধ্যে থেকেও হ্যাঁ আমাদের ডাকে সারা দিয়ে হ্যাঁ সময় এগিয়ে এসছে আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমাদের কলেজের প্রিন্সিপাল স্যার 
যিনি সবসময় উৎসব উৎসাহ দেন বিভিন্ন রকম প্রোগ্রাম অনুষ্ঠান এবং নতুন নতুন কনসেপ্ট নিয়ে আমাদের সামনে হাজির করতে এবং আজকের এই কনসেপ্ট যেটা হলো শুধু আমাদের সামনে নয় অনেক কলেজের টিচাররা আমাদের প্রাক্তন সহকর্মীরা রূপেন্দু স্যার আছেন হ্যাঁ পীযুষবাবু আছেন আমাদের সঙ্গে চাকরি করিনি কিন্তু আমাদের সার্ভিসেরই লোক এরকম অনেক অনেকেই আছেন তা তারাও আসছে জয়েন করেছে ফলে আমি শান্তনুবাবুকে অবশ্যই ধন্যবাদ জানাই এই অর্গানাইজটা করার জন্য এবং আমাদের প্রাক্তন যারা টিচার তারা জয়েন করেছেন এই অনুষ্ঠানে তাদেরকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই তারা উৎসাহ নিয়ে আগ্রহ নিয়ে অনুষ্ঠানটা শুনেছেন এবং আমি বর্তমানে যেসব শিক্ষক শিক্ষিকারা হ্যাঁ বিভিন্ন কলেজে আছেন তাদেরকেও আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাই কারণ তারা এই আমাদের ডাকে সাড়া দিয়ে এই সেমিনারটাতে এসে তারা সেমিনারটিকে সাফল্য মন্ডিত করেছেন আমি ছাত্রছাত্রীদের বলবো যে তোমরা এই ইউ আর ভেরি মাচ এনলাইটেড আই থিঙ্ক সো তোমরা সত্যি আলোকিত হয়েছ ওই ব্যাপারটাতে এবং অনেক কিছু জানতে পেরেছ নতুন নতুন জিনিস এবং আমি আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাই আমাদের কলেজের আইকুয়েসি কোয়ার্ডিনেটর হ্যাঁ কোয়ার্ডিনেটরকে চুটালি ম্যাডামকে যিনি সবসময়ই সঙ্গে থেকে প্রত্যেকটা সেমিনার প্রত্যেকটা অনুষ্ঠান যাতে সাফল্য মন্ডিত হয় তার জন্য উৎসাহ দিয়ে থাকেন আমি অন্যান্য আমাদের কলেজের অন্যান্য ডিপার্টমেন্টের যেসব স্যাররা আছেন ম্যাডামরা আছেন তাদেরকে আমি ধন্যবাদ জানাই কারণ তারা যখনই আমরা তাদেরকে ডাকি যে আমাদের সেমিনার হচ্ছে হ্যাঁ তো তোমরা এসো তখনই কিন্তু তারা কিন্তু আসে সেটা সেটা বাংলাই হোক বা ইংরাজি হোক বা সায়েন্স ডিপার্টমেন্টই হোক বা আর্টস ডিপার্টমেন্ট তারা কিন্তু উৎসাহ নিয়ে তারা আসে হ্যাঁ তারা তারা সবসময় আমাদের উৎসাহ দেয় এবং উৎসাহ যুগিয়ে যায় আমি তাদেরকে সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি এবং আমি আর্থবোধে কেউ বাকি রইল না আমি সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ জানাচ্ছি হ্যাঁ এটা জানিয়ে আমি আমার বক্তব্যটা শেষ করলাম সবাইকে ধন্যবাদ খুব ভালো লাগে চলো টাটা গুড নাইট এভরিওয়ান